Anne Frank, middle of page 145. Wednesday, November 17, 1943. Dearest Kitty, Recent events have the house rocking on its foundations. Owing to an outbreak of diphtheria at Bepps, she won't be allowed to come in contact with us for six weeks. Without her, the cooking and shopping will be very difficult, not to mention how much we'll miss her company. Mr. Kleinman is still in bed and has eaten nothing but gruel for three weeks. Mr. Kugler is up to his neck in work. Margot sends her Latin lessons to a teacher, who corrects and then returns them. She's registered under Bep's name, the teacher very nicely, and witty too. I bet he's glad to have such a smart student. Dussel is in a turmoil, and we don't know why. It all began with Dussel's, Dussel's saying nothing when he was upstairs. He didn't exchange so much as a word with either Mr. or Miss Van Dan. We all noticed it. This went on for a few days, and then Mother took the opportunity to warn him about Miss Van Dee, who could make life miserable for him. Dussel said Mr. Van Dan had started the silent treatment, and he had no intention of breaking it. I should explain that yesterday was November 16th, the first anniversary of his living in the annex. Mother received a plan in honor of the occasion, but Miss Van Dee, who had alluded to the date for weeks, and made no bones about the fact that she thought Dussel should treat us to dinner, received nothing. Instead of making use of the opportunity to thank us for the first time, for unselfishly taking him in, he didn't utter a word. And on the morning of the 16th, when I asked him whether I should offer him my congratulations or my condolences, he replied that either one would do. Mother, having cast herself in the role of peacemaker, made no headway whatsoever, and the situation finally ended in a draw. I can say without exaggeration that Dussel has definitely got a screw loose. We often laugh to ourselves because he has no memory, no fixed opinions, and no common sense. He's amused us more than once by trying to pass on the news he just heard, since the message invariably gets garbled in transmission. Furthermore, he answers every reproach or accusation with a load of fine promises, which he never manages to keep. Der man hat immer grossen Geist. Uns ist klein von Dallen. Yours, Anne. Saturday, November 27, 1943. Dearest Kitty, last night, just as I was falling asleep, Hanelli suddenly appeared before me. I saw her there, dressed in rags, her face thin and worn. She looked at me with such sadness and reproach in her enormous eyes that I could not read the messages in them. Oh, Anne, why have you deserted me? Help me, help me, rescue me from this hell. And I can't help her. I can only stand by and watch while other people suffer and die. All I can do is pray to God to bring her back to us. I saw Hanelli and no one else, and I understood why. I misjudged her, wasn't mature enough to understand how difficult it was for her. She was devoted to her girlfriend, and it must have seemed as though I was trying to take her away. The poor thing, she must have felt awful, I know, because I recognized the feeling in myself. I had an occasional flash of understanding, but then got selfishly wrapped up again in my own problems and pleasures. It was mean of me to treat her that way, and now she was looking at me, oh so helplessly, with her pale face and beseeching eyes. If only I could help her. Dear God, I have everything I could wish for, which, while fate has her in its deadly clutches. She was as devout as I am, maybe even more so, and she too wanted to do what was right. But then why have I been chosen to live while she is probably going to die? What's the difference between us? Why are we now so far apart? To be honest, I hadn't thought of her for months, no, for at least a year. I hadn't forgotten her entirely, and yet it wasn't until I saw her before me that I thought of all her sufferings. Oh, Hanelli, I hope that if you live to the end of the war and return to us, I'll be able to take you in and make up for the wrong I've done you. But even if I were ever in a position to help, she wouldn't need it more than she does now. I wonder if she ever thinks of me and what she's feeling. Merciful God, comfort her, so that at least she won't be alone. Oh, if only you could tell her that I'm thinking of her with compassion and love. It might help her go on. I've got to stop dwelling on this, and it won't get me anywhere. I keep seeing her enormous eyes, and they haunt me. Does Sinelli really and truly believe in God, or has religion merely been foistered upon her? I don't even know that. I never took the trouble to ask. Hanelli, Hanelli. If only I could take you away. If only I could share everything I have with you. It's too late. I can't help or undo the wrong I've done. But I'll never forget her again, and I'll always pray for her. Yours, Anne. 
Monday, December 6, 1943. Dearest Kitty, the closer it got to St. Nicholas Day, the more we all thought back to last year's festivity. It's festively decorated a basket. More than anyone, I thought it would be terrible to skip a celebration this year. After a long deliberation, I finally came up with an idea, something funny. I consulted Pim, and a week ago, we set to work writing a verse for each person. Sunday evening at a quarter to eight, we dropped upstairs carrying the big laundry basket, which had been decorated with cutouts and bows made of pink and blue carbon paper. On top was a large piece of brown wrapping paper with a note attached. Everyone was rather amazed at the sheer size of the gift. I removed the note and read it aloud. Once again, St. Nicholas Day has even come to our hideaway. It won't be quite as fun, I fear, as the happy day we had last year. Then we were hopeful, no reason to doubt, that optimism would win the bout. And by the time this year came round, we'd all be free and safe and sound. Still, let's not forget it's St. Nicholas Day. Though we've never nothing left to give away, we'll have to find something else to do. So everyone, please look in their shoe. As each person took their own shoe out of the basket, there was a roar of laughter. Inside each shoe was a little paper package addressed to its owner. Yours, Anne. Wednesday, December 22nd, 1943. Dearest Kitty, A bad case of flu has prevented me from writing to you until today. Being sick here is dreadful. With every cough, I had to duck under the blanket once, twice, three times and try to keep from coughing any more. Most of the time, the tickle refused to go away, so I had to drink milk with honey, sugar, or cough drops. I get dizzy just thinking about all the cures I've been subjected to, sweating out the fever, steam treatments, sweat compresses, dry compresses, hot drinks, swabbing my throat, lying still, heating pad, hot water bottles, lemonade, and every two hours, the thermometer. Will these remedies really make you better? The worst part was when Mr. Dussel decided to play doctor and laid his palmated hand on my bare chest to listen to the sounds. Not only did his hair tickle, but I was embarrassed, even though he went to school 30 years ago and does have some kind of medical degree. Why should he lay his head on my heart? After all, he's not my boyfriend. For that matter, he wouldn't be able to tell a healthy sound from an unhealthy one. He'd have to have his ears cleaned first, since he's becoming alarmingly hard of hearing. But enough about my illness. I'm fit as a fiddle again. I've grown almost half an inch and gained two pounds. I'm pale but itching to get back to my books. <coughs> Oshenweiss, the only word that will do here. We're all getting on to get well together. No squabbles, though that probably won't last long. There hasn't been such peace and quiet in this house for at least six months. Beppa is still in isolation, but any day now her sister will no longer be contagious. For Christmas, we're getting extra cooking oil, candy, and molasses. For Hanukkah, Mr. Dussel gave us... Gave Miss Van Dan and Mother a beautiful cake, which she asked Meep to bake, on top of all the work she had to do. Marg and I received a brooch made out of a penny, all bright and shiny. I can't really describe it, but it's lovely. I also have a Christmas present for Meep and Bep. For a whole month, I've saved up the sugar I put on my hot cereal, and Mr. Kleinman has used it to have fondant made. The weather is drizzly and overcast, the stove stinks, and the food lies heavily on our stomachs, producing a variety of rumbles. The war is at an impasse. Spirits are low. Yours, Anne. Friday, December 24th, 1943. Dear Kitty, as I've written you many times before, moods have a tendency to affect us quite a bit here, and in my case, it's been getting worse lately. Certainly applies to me. I'm on top of the world when I think of how fortunate we are and compare myself to other Jewish children. And in the depths of despair, when, for example, Miss Kleinman comes by and talks about Jopi's hockey club, canoe trips, school plays, and afternoon teas with friends... I don't think I'm jealous of Jopi, but I long to have a really good time for once and to laugh so hard it hurts. We're stuck in this house like lepers, especially during winter and the Christmas and New Year's holiday. Actually, I shouldn't even be writing this since it makes me seem so ungrateful, but I can't keep everything to myself, so I'll repeat what I said at the beginning. Paper is more patient than people. Whenever someone comes in from outside with the wind in their clothes and the cold on their cheeks, I feel like burying my head under the blankets to keep from thinking. When will we be allowed to breathe fresh air again? I can't do that. On the contrary, I have to hold my head up high and put a bold face on things. But the thoughts keep coming anyway, not just once, but over and over.
Believe me, if you've been shut up for a year and a half, it can get to be too much for you sometimes, but feelings can't be ignored, no matter how unjust or ungrateful they seem. I long to ride a bike, dance, whistle, look at the world, feel young, and know that I am free, and yet I can't let it show. Just imagine what would happen if all eight of us were to feel sorry for ourselves or walk around with the discontented clearly visible on our faces. Where would that get us? I sometimes wonder if anyone will ever understand what I mean, if anyone will ever overlook my ingratitude and not worry about whether or not I'm a Jewish and merely see me as a teenager badly in need of some good, plain fun. I don't know, and I wouldn't be able to talk about it with anyone since I'm sure I'd start to cry. Crying can bring relief as long as you don't cry alone. Despite all my theories and efforts, I miss every day and every hour of the day having a mother who understands me. That's why with everything I do and write, I imagine the kind of mom I'd like to be to my children later on. The kind of mom who doesn't take everything people say too seriously, but who does take me seriously. I find it difficult to describe what I mean, but the word mom says it all. Do you know what I've come up with in order to give me the feeling of calling my mother something that sounds like mom? I often call her momsy. Sometimes I shorten it to moms, an imperfect mom. I wish I could honor her by removing the S. It's a good thing she doesn't realize this, since it would only make her unhappy. Well, that's enough of that. My writing has raised me somewhat from the depths of despair. Yours, Anne. It's the day after Christmas, and I can't help thinking about Pim and the story he told me this time last year. I didn't understand the meaning of his words then as well as I do now. If only he would bring it up again, I might be able to show him I understand what he meant. I think Pimp told me because he, who knows the intimate secrets of so many others, needed to express his own feelings for once. Pimp never talks about himself, and I don't think Margot has any inkling of what he's been through. Poor Pimp. He can't fool me into thinking he's forgotten that girl. He never will. It's made him very accommodating since he's not blind to mother's faults. I hope I'm going to be a little like him without having to go through what he has. Anne. Monday, December 27th, 1943, Friday evening. For the first time in my life, I received a Christmas present. Mr. Kleinman, Mr. Kluger, and the girls have prepared a wonderful surprise for us. Me made a delicious Christmas cake with Peace 1944 written on the top, and Beth provided a batch of cookies that was up to pre-war standards. There was a jar of yogurt for Peter, Margot, and me, and a bottle of beer for each of the adults. And once again, everything was wrapped so nicely with pretty pictures glued to the packages. For the rest, the holiday passed by quickly for us, and Wednesday, December 29th, 1943, it was very sad again last night. Grandma and Ella came to me once more. Grandma, oh my sweet grandma, how little we understood what she suffered, how kind she always was, and what an interest she took in everything that concerned us. And to think that all the time she was carefully guarding her terrible secret. Grandma was always so loyal and good. She would never have let any of us down. Whatever happened, no matter how much I misbehaved, Grandma always stuck up for me. Grandma, did you love me or did you not understand me either? I don't know. How lonely Grandma must have been in spite of us. You can be lonely even when you're loved by many people, since you're still not anybody's one and only. And Hanelli, is she still alive? What's she doing? Dear God, watch over her and bring her back to us. And Ellie, you're a reminder of what my fate might have been. I keep seeing myself in your place, so why am I often miserable about what goes on here? Shouldn't I be happy, contented, and glad, except when I'm thinking of Nellie and those suffering along with her? I'm selfish and cowardly. Why do I always think and dream the most awful things and want to scream in terror? Because in spite of everything, I still don't have faith in God. He's given me so much, which I don't deserve, and yet each day I make so many mistakes. Thinking about the suffering of those you hold dear can reduce you to tears. In fact, you could spend the whole day crying. The most you can do is pray for God to perform a miracle and save at least some of them. And I hope I'm doing enough of that. Anne. 
Thursday, December 30th, 1943. Dearest Kitty, since the last raging quarrels, things have settled down here. Not only between ourselves, Dussel and upstairs, but also between Mr. and Miss Van D. Nevertheless, a few dark thunderclouds are heading this way, and all because of food. Miss Van D. came up with this ridiculous idea of frying fewer potatoes in the morning and saving them for later in the day. Mother and Dussel and the rest of us didn't agree with her, so now we're dividing up the potatoes as well. It seems that fats and oils aren't being doled out fairly, and Mother's going to have to put a stop to it. I'll let you know if there are any interesting developments. For the last few months now, we've been splitting up the meats. There's the fats, ours without, the soup, they eat it, we don't, the potatoes, there's peeled, ours not, the extras, and now the fried potatoes too. If only we could split up completely. <laughs> Yours, Anne. P.S. Beth had a picture of postcard of the entire royal family copied from me. Juliana looks very young, and so does the queen. Three little girls are adorable. It was incredibly nice of Beth, don't you think?